For most of the last century, humanity was terrified that we were having too many children. Democracy cannot survive overpopulation. Human dignity cannot survive it. Convenience and decency cannot survive it. As you put more and more people onto the world, the value of life not only declines, but it disappears. From the 1950s to the 1990s, experts warned that a global population explosion could exhaust the planet's resources and trigger mass starvation. China became infamous for its one-child policy, but other countries too, like Mexico, Peru, and Bangladesh, used forced sterilizations, propaganda campaigns, and threatened to deny women food and services if they didn't comply with family planning measures. But now, only a few decades later, the narrative has completely flipped. Instead of overpopulation, we now seem to be facing the exact opposite crisis, falling fertility rates. Why is this happening? And how could this shift affect your life? Let's get into it. To understand why this reversal is happening and what's driving families to have fewer children today, new research is starting to point toward some surprising explanations. According to the Brookings Institution, almost half of all countries worldwide now fall below the replacement fertility level. That's the threshold, 2.1 children per woman, needed to keep a population stable. In the United States, the rate has slipped to around 1.7. And this isn't just a statistic on a chart. Lower fertility has real consequences, especially for government transfer programs like Social Security and national pension systems that depend on a steady or growing workforce. Policymakers are beginning to understand how deeply this trend could reshape the future labor market. Now, here's something critical. We only see this declining birth rate effect in high-income countries, which begs the question, why? In richer countries, shouldn't families have more resources to care for more children? Well, yes, in theory, but sociologists point to several key differences in countries with low versus high birth rates. One leading theory is called social comparison. The argument goes like this. In many high-income cultures, parents face what's called an educational arms race. Families feel compelled to invest heavily in each child through the best schools they can afford. Things like tutoring, extracurricular programs, and every advantage they can provide. That pressure pushes parents toward what economists call the quantity-quality trade-off. If each child becomes more expensive, both financially and emotionally, families choose fewer of them. Look, this is the Economic Connectedness Index, developed by Raj Shetty. It measures the income level of the people in your online social circle, whether you're connected to more high-income friends or low-income friends. According to the data, the more someone's social circle leans toward higher status, the stronger the upward comparison pressure becomes. This means parents in higher-income countries have a cultural incentive to pour more resources into each child instead of distributing their time and resources across many children. Not only do people invest more per child, but they also put off having children until later in life. In the US, the average age of first-time mothers is 27.5 years, and the numbers are even higher for men and people in Europe. Social comparison means many don't want to bring a child into the world unless they've reached certain career or life goals. But waiting till you feel like you're well off enough to keep up with the Joneses means eventually biology is going to start making it harder for you to conceive. Of course, there are lots of theories about why people are having fewer children around the world. But no matter the cause, there's one big problem that has policymakers losing sleep. Social security and pension programs. We have talked about it before on the channel, but essentially, these systems depend on having a constant supply of fresh workers to keep the checks flowing to previous generations. If birth rates fall low enough, there won't be enough young workers to pay for the costs of an aging population. One solution proposed is taxing educational services like private tutoring to make elite educational competition less attractive. The authors at the Brookings Institute argue this could reduce inequality and temper the pressure to invest heavily in each child. But that raises a moral dilemma. Is it fair for the state to punish families just because they're trying to secure better opportunities for their kids? Others say we should incentivize more children by offering benefits for having kids. The Japanese government, for example, pays families around 15,000 yen a month for every child ages 3 to 15. That's about 95 US dollars. In my opinion, these policy experts are too focused on the stats and numbers of the birth rate problem and not focused enough on the people at the heart of the issue. Behind every point on that graph, are real families and individuals making real decisions. There are many factors that go into a person's decision about whether it's time to have a child or not. And 
fiddling with the tax code probably isn't convincing a 25 year old to settle down if they're not ready anyway. Children aren't just an asset for the nation or a cost for the school system to bear, they're humans and they should be treated that way. This video is researched by Adil Urbanki. If you wanna support this show, the best way is to keep watching our content. If you're interested in US politics and world news from an independent perspective, there's a playlist on screen. Thanks for watching.